Okay, so uh, today is our fourth physics seminar uh, this semester, and it's our pleasure to have uh, Matthew Sullivan with us. He's a physics ma he was a physics major and also math major here at NSU uh, a couple years ago, and he he graduated, and then now he's a, a graduate student at uh, OU uh, doing medical physics. So today he's going to share with us his experience in grad school and everything. Okay. Matthew, your turn. All right. Thank you for the introduction. So as Dr. Zhang said, I was a grad, or I was an undergraduate student at SU in the applied physics program. Uh, I did a double major in applied physics and mathematics, and I graduated in the fall of 2019. And then that January, so January 2020, I started in the master's program in medical physics at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And so the goal of this topic is to give sort of some intuition or some insight into how graduate school would be for somebody coming from a STEM program and what sort of things you could expect in programs like this one in the medical physics programs and, and to sort of get the, uh, the word out more or less and getting people interested in programs like this one. So to give you an idea of how this talk will go, um, initially we're gonna talk about what medical physics is and specifically how you would get involved in the, in, in the discipline and how you would become a board certified medical physicist. So what your game plan would be, where you would apply to, what sort of programs you would wanna be uh, interested in and all the associated goals you would need to set um, to achieve that. After that, we'll talk about some subfields in medical physics. Um, specifically, so uh, at, at the current program I'm in at OU, I am a graduate student in the therapy program. So all of the clinical work I do is in an oncology clinic. Um, and so we'll go into the sort of things graduate students do, the sort of jobs they do independently and also along with physicists in, um, in programs like this one. Uh, keep in mind though, I only have experience with this program. So I can't tell you how other programs will, will be. I do know that OU has a very, very high level uh, of clinical experience they're able to give their their graduate students so we'll go into more detail about about what tasks graduate students on the therapy side do on a daily basis and then finally i wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that i'm doing in in uh, therapeutic medical physics so what is medical physics it's pretty self-explanatory it's just the application of physics in the field of medicine um, medical physics is a field responsible for the foundations of radiology departments and radiation, radiation oncology, as well as nuclear medicine. Any hospital or clinic that uses radiation equipment will require individuals with medical physics training to maintain the equipment. And when we say maintain, we don't mean fix. That's kind of a misconception. Medical physicists aren't engineers. They're not responsible for fixing the issues with the equipment. More so, they're responsible for performing quality assurance testing and ensuring that the, the equipment is performing uh, to the standard that, that is required for clinical needs. So how would you become a medical physicist? What would be your game plan if you were coming out of undergraduate and, and you were interested in, the, interested in this field? The first thing you would wanna do is look up CAMPEP accredited programs. CAMPEP is the uh, accrediting board responsible for um, giving accreditation to different graduate programs. Um, and they work in conjunction with other organizations that are responsible for board certification. So if you are wanting to be a board certified medical physicist, which in my opinion should be sort of your end goal if you want to get into this field, you would want to apply and get accepted to CAMPEP programs. Uh, so they, they're responsible, like what we just said, for accrediting grad programs as well as residency programs. And we'll go into more about uh, what a residency is um, later on in the talk. So an example of a CAMPEP program is OU, the HSC. Uh, their medical physics program is CAMPEP accredited. So that would be a good candidate. I mean, you're close um, relatively and uh, the, the resources are there for you to be very successful. So how would you be admitted or what, what sort of things would you need to accomplish in order to be admitted to OU HSC's medical physics program? Uh, you would need eight credit hours of calculus and three credit hours of differential equations, as well as at least eight credit hours of calculus-based general physics courses, along with modern physics and two other uh, upper-level undergrad physics courses. 
totaling for, for six hours, along with a general chemistry course. So any sort of undergraduate general, general chemistry course would fill that requirement. Um, the other uh, course requirement is a four credit hour college level anatomy and physiology course. OU has recently allowed their students to take part in the HSC's anatomy and physiology course um, concurrently in the program. So if you don't have this requirement, you're capable of taking this course while you're in the program. You'll also need to take the GRE and get scores for the verbal and quantitative portions. Uh, you need three, three letters of recommendation. So that's good motivation to keep good relationships with your professors because they're the ones that would, that would do that for you. You would need to write a statement of purpose, why you're interested in the program, what sort of things you can offer, what you're looking to get out of it, um, things like that. And for non-native English speakers, uh, TOEFL requirements are also required. So I'm not really sure what goes into that, but I uh, included a link at the bottom here that lists all of the application requirements for their medical physics program. And I plan on emailing this presentation to Dr. Zhang, Dr. Zhang so he can distribute it so you guys can get all the information you need if you're interested in applying. So what sort of degrees are offered in this program? Well, if you're coming from undergraduate, you would be interested in the master's degree. If you already have a master's, you, you could look into to a PhD, but um, for the most part, most of you guys would be interested in, in the master's program, which is a 32 credit hour program. Uh, there is a thesis requirement and no more of those 32 credit hours can, or no more than six of those 32 credit hours can be from research. So what sort of coursework would you be looking at in the master's program? These are the core courses. I didn't include some of the electives. There are other electives. They have some, some interesting topics. You can take uh, directed study courses in different fields. They have artificial intelligence courses relating to medical physics. They have a lot of opportunities to, to educate uh, students in, in a lot of pertinent ways. But the main courses, uh, the, the top three you see, radiological physics, one, two, and three, those are the three primary subdisciplines of medical physics. So we have radiation therapy, nuclear medicine, and diagnostic imaging, along with that anatomy and physiology course that you could take either before you get into the program or concurrently in the program. Uh, you'll have to take an intro to radiation biology and chemistry. So any pre-med people out there that have a lot of bio and chemistry background, uh, don't let the physics and the math requirement scare you because this is, I mean, the radiation biology and chemistry courses are, are as taxing as anything else. And if you have a, a strong background, then you'd perform well in this program. Um, radiation protection and shielding is another important component, as well as how ionizing radiation is, is produced and how it's absorbed and how that radiation is detected and measured. So this is sort of an overview of the different topics you would be covering in a medical physics program like OU's. So moving on to the thesis section, not all master's degrees do require a thesis. Uh, a thesis. This one does, however. Um, so the way thesis works, you work alongside an academic advisor and the way OU has it structured, you have essentially free reign to choose whatever, whatever advisor you'd like. There, there might be some bureaucracy in every, in every uh, program. So as far as like, if a particular advisor has too many students, you probably wouldn't be able to work with them but you're able to really tailor your interests and pick advisors that fit your strengths. So you're, you're capable of working on a lot of different projects. And I've listed some of the more popular projects here. Uh, computer science majors would probably be interested in Monte Carlo simulations. Um, a lot of therapeutic applications as far as image guided radiotherapy and, and modeling brachytherapy, which we'll talk about brachytherapy more in depth later. Um, and then there's also a lot of imaging uh, topics and nuclear medicine topics at your disposal too. So you're really, you're limited to your own interests essentially. So whatever, whatever you, you find yourself interested in the field, you could find an advisor that would be willing to take you up on that interest. Okay, so assuming that you've gotten accepted to the CAMPEP program and you're, you're doing well, the, the process of actually becoming a board certified physicist is handled by the ABR or the American Board of Radiology. And the way they certify their physicists, it's in three parts. Uh, part one, uh, so this is why it's important to be from a CAMPEP accredited program. If you're not part of that program, you can't even 
start the process of becoming board certified. You have to be from a CAMPEP accredited program to take part one. Um, now you can take the part one uh, concurrently if you're still enrolled or you can take it after. When you start applying to residencies, having already passed part one is a big selling point for you. So um, your odds of landing a residency or getting matched go way up if you're from a CAMPEP accredited program and you're doing well and you've also passed part one. But in order to complete the full certification process, you have to pass all three parts. Part one of the ABR is over general medical physics and clinical applications. Part two uh, specializes or is a more specialized exam based on your, uh, your specialty or your residency selection. So we'll talk more about how the residency functions in a, in a couple minutes, but you're able to specify, you're able to choose which residency program you'd like to go in. And, and there are two primary categories. There are diagnostic imaging residencies and then radiation therapy residencies. And nuclear medicine sort of weasels its way into both of those subfields in a way. So the primary two there, uh, uh, residencies you could choose from are, are imaging and therapeutic residencies. So part two will be based on your residency. Um, and then part three is an oral exam. So in order to pass, in order to become board certified, you have to pass all three of the ABR exams. Okay, so moving on to residencies. Typically, uh, a residency lasts about two years. Uh, and in order to be uh, applicable, in, in order to, to be um, capable of even applying or, or being accepted to a residency, you have to be from a camp up program. In addition, you have to take at least three upper division or upper level undergraduate physics courses as well. So the idea of a residency, it's the same, say if you were uh, coming out of medical school and you were interested in radiation oncology, what you would do is go through a radiation oncology residency in which you rotate through all the different clinical responsibilities that are associated with being a radiation oncologist. So the same idea holds true for medical physicists in that if you go into a, a therapy residency, you're gonna rotate through all of the different clinical aspects of of what a medical therapist does. So you're gonna learn all of the roles, all of all of the jobs that they do, all the responsibilities, and the same goes for the imaging residencies. So to summarize how you would go about becoming a board certified physicist, I didn't include this, I kind of felt it was self-explanatory, but you need to graduate from undergrad first. That's, that's important. And then you need to get accepted and complete a CAMPEP accredited graduate program. And like we talked about, you can, you can complete part one of the ABR while you're in the program, but parts one, two, and three have to be completed in order to be board certified. And you also have to complete a camp of accredited residency program. So some additional notes to sort of persuade you that, that this is a good idea. The residencies are paid. Uh, typically, they're on the scale of 50 to 60,000 a year. Uh, so say if you went into a master's program and decided you didn't want to go straight from a master's to a residency, you could also do a PhD and PhDs are almost always funded. So there, there would be, there would be opportunities for you in that as well. Board certified medical physicists, it's not uncommon to see, uh, salaries in the range of 120,000 a year, typically between 100 and 150 is where you would see most salaries lie. And I added this note because I think it's important. It, this opportunity allows you to be idealistic in a sense that you're able to help people. You're able to be an active part of a clinic or an active part of a radiology department while also you know, being financially secure. So there's something, to, there's something to be said about having the opportunity to be idealistic and also lucrative. And OUHSC would be an awesome opportunity for you. And then all the, the clinical experience you get um, and both the, the therapy side and the diagnostic side, and it's paid. So it, it's not, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it's certainly worth, uh, the experience you, you're getting paid to, to get high levels of clinical experience. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about as far as organizations go is the AAPM. It's the American Association of Physicists and Medicine. This organization is sort of like a regulatory body in that it develops uh, reports called task groups. And these are 
widely referenced when um, medical physicists do things like commission a new therapy machine. They'll they'll have <clears throat> associated task groups for the acceptance and commissioning of different machines, whether it be <clears throat> clinical or, ther or uh, therapeutic or, or diagnostic. And so the, these task group reports have very, very um, painstakingly uh, written out all of the different procedures you would want to do in the process of commissioning and accepting um, different clinical machines. Okay, so moving on to the subfields of medical physics. We talked about uh, the subfields a little already, but the, the one that I'm going to be focused on the most and that it's, it's where I work and where my research lies is radiation therapy. The other two are diagnostic imaging and nuclear medicine. So in nuclear medicine, it's the application of radioactive materials for the purpose of treating and diagnosing diseases. Um, as far as imaging goes, you would see applications of nuclear medicine and PET, which is positron emission tomography, or SPECT, which is single photon emission computed tomography. And those imaging modalities, radioactive tracers are injected in the patients, uh, which are gamma ray emitters. And they have specialized detector equipment uh, that have associated scintillation crystal structures, which are utilized to convert gamma ray photons to light photons. And, and um, they have different electrical components, such as uh, photo conductors that allow for the detection of, of the uh, distribution pattern of those radionuclides in the patient's body. And so that's how the images are formed from the uh, radioactive tracers in the body. The primary functions or the primary purpose of using nuclear medicine and imaging would be to um, track perfusion like blood flow or to measure organ function. It could also, also be used in the form of therapy in the localization of these radionuclides. So the, uh, the energy released via the decay would, would dose, provide the dose to the patient. Okay, so moving on to diagnostic physics. So the purpose of diagnostic physics is imaging. So in, in this subfield, what you're going to do mostly is study the different imaging modalities and how they apply to medical physics in different ways. Um, so in diagnostic radiology, we use the EM spectrum outside of the visible light range to produce these medical images. And I've included a couple examples of, of the different ranges. So for example, x-rays would be used in mammography and computed tomography. Radio frequency signals are used in MRI and gamma rays are used in nuclear medicine. So I wanted to go through a couple of the modalities really quick in diagnostic imaging. Uh, we'll go through radiography, fluoroscopy, mammography, CT, and MRI. So what is radiography, right? Radiography is essentially a projection or a pulse of x-ray photons on a patient. And as the photons pass through the patient's body, different structures in the patient will attenuate those photons differently. And uh, the resultant heterogeneous X-ray distribution, which is received by the detector is what constitutes your image. So this was made possible by a guy named Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. He was the first guy to receive the Nobel Prize in physics. And most of us have had a chest X-ray or an arm X-ray or some sort of radiograph in our lives, maybe dental. What happens is an x-ray source is placed on one side of the patient and a detector is placed on the other side. And like we were saying, the image is a result of a homogeneous x-ray distribution interacting with different attenuating structures in the body and, and the result of heterogeneous distribution coming in contact with the, um, with the detector. Typically we see diagnostic energy ranges fall between 20 kV and 150 kV. There are exceptions, which we'll talk about here in a second, but I wanted to ask a question really quick. I, I don't know if I'll get some answers. I hope so. Uh, is the image produced via radiography? Is that a negative image or a positive image? Uh, you're muted, Professor John. I think you're muted, Dr. John. Negative, it's negative. It's negative, good, yeah. Negative. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. <laughs> yeah, it's negative because, oh, well, here, we can see a picture. So you see uh, bones are more attenuating structures than like the lungs, for example. So 
So the bones are attenuating structures. Uh, so the fluence of the photons on the detector behind the bones would be less, or the intensity would be less than, for example, the lungs, because the lungs are primarily air, right? Most of the photons are just going to go through and, and strike the detector. So uh, thicker, more attenuating structures appear lighter, and less attenuating structures appear darker, because more photons are coming in contact with the detector. And here's an example of a chest x-ray. We have an x-ray source here. A uh, patient or a guy in between the source and the detector, and then you have the detector on the other side of the patient. So the next modality is fluoroscopy. Uh, essentially, fluoroscopy is real-time radiography. Uh, the detectors used in fluoroscopy have to be very efficient in that they produce uh, images in rapid temporal sequence. And what we mean by temporal sequence or temporal resolution, it's essentially like the frame rate. Um, the frame rate used for real-time imaging in fluoroscopy is about 30 frames per second, but there are different modalities, different, or not different modalities, there are different methods such as pulsed fluoroscopy that can get away with using lower frame rates to achieve the same effect. The primary purpose of fluoroscopy is, is to position things like catheters and arteries or to view contrast agents in the, in the GI tract. Um, other Potential reasons would be, say, if you wanted to clear a stroke or something, they, they would use fluoroscopy for that. Uh, it can also be used to detect anatomical motion. So, for example, in the form of a, of a cardiac cycle, you're able to see all the elements of the heart moving through a full cycle because you're able to see the, the real-time representation of, of those things. So here's an example of a fluoroscopy unit. This is the x-ray source. The detector is in the table you see a lot of shielding, right? There's like a lead curtain here. This guy's got a lead apron on and hopefully a thyroid collar. This, this person also has that. The reason why we have to be very careful, careful in fluoroscopy is, is backscatter. So there's a lot of x-ray production because you're, you're generating images in real time. So you're producing a lot of radiation and structures like the table could potentially backscatter that radiation into, um, into people outside of the patient. So uh, anytime you're in a fluoro unit, you always have to make sure you're wearing at least lead aprons and thyroid collars. Some places will also require you to use like lead goggles. Um, your eyes are relatively radiosensitive. So uh, there, there's a lot of protective precautions involved in, in a lot of these modalities, but especially fluoroscopy. Okay, moving on to mammography. Uh, it's just a radiograph of the breast used specifically to screen women who are asymptomatic for breast cancer or to assist in the diagnosis of breast cancer. So the distinction between screening and, and diagnosing, when you screen somebody, you don't know that there is a malignancy. You don't know that there's an issue. What you're doing is you're trying to find it. So there are very, very strict regulations on, for example, the dose you can use per image in, in, uh, a, uh, in a mammogram. Um, so for example, typically screening mammograms result in four images. They have two uh, cranial caudal images, so from the top down, and two medial lateral oblique images from, from angles oblique and uh, from the median lateral axes of the patient. And I believe the, the dose regulation is like three milligrade per image. It's very, very small because structures like the breast are very radiosensitive. And the goal is not to diagnose in, in, the, in the situation of a screening, it's to see if there's anything there. But the distinction comes when you do find something that it moves on to a diagnosis. And in this situation, uh, dose regulations fall off a lot because any sort of dose to the patient can be seen as beneficial if there's a malignancy because you're potentially treating the, the, the target area. And uh, because you're talking about uh, radio, uh, radio sensitive structures, they use lower X-ray energies than general purpose radiography and mammography. And so here's an example of a, of a mammography unit. You can see some uh, different structures like a face shield. This is used to keep the patient's face or head out of the, the uh, beam. So this is the source, this is the detector. Then they have a compression panel to make the, the structures uniform so you get even distributions of the photons through the patient and things along that nature. There, there are 
very complex machines and and really interesting to to learn all the different functions of okay moving on to kind of the the big player in in uh, diagnostic imaging is the computed tomography units or ct units they became clinically available back in the 1970s uh, the way they work, images are produced by passing x-rays through the patient at many angles and rotating the x-ray tube in the detectors around the patient. Uh, the, this generates slice-by-slice -slice images through filtered back projection, and it gives you 3D representations of anatomy instead of 2D representations. Modern CT scanners typically can acquire between 0.5 and 0.62 millimeter thick images along a 50 cm length of patient in about five seconds. And CTs contribute to a lot of the uh, dose that the average person would experience in, in, like a, in like a civilian setting because about 60 million CTs are conducted annually. So here's, here's a CT unit. Uh, the x-ray tube and the detectors are circular in this case instead of flat. I don't know if you noticed in mammography and in radiography, the detectors were flat. In CT, you have fan beam and cone beam geometry. So you have to have curved detectors um, to avoid things like uh, uneven dose distributions or uneven distributions of the fluence on the detector. Okay, so moving on to an imaging modality that doesn't use ionizing radiation, MRI. Uh, the, the principle of MRI is it uses powerful magnets in a series of high frequency uh, RF pulses, hold on, I can't see that, RF pulses to obtain reconstructed images. So like we said, it doesn't use ionizing radiation. Uh, it does provide very high soft tissue contrast relative to things like a radiograph or like a, uh, like a, a uh, mammogram or like um, a, a fluoroscopy unit or something like that. Now, it might seem that it's safer in, in terms of Cancer, it's certainly safer because cancer is caused by stochastic effects due to ionizing radiation. If there's no ionizing radiation, then the probability of cancer is zero, right? But that's not to say that there aren't dangers associated with MRIs. I wanted to include sort of the, the typical magnet strength used in the clinical MRI. It's between 0.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla. And that's between five and 6,000 times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. Um, so the danger in, in something like fluoroscopy, say you forget to use, you forget to put on your apron or you forget to put on your thyroid collar, maybe you get cancer in 30 years. If you do something irresponsible or you make a mistake in MRI, maybe you get seriously hurt or die the same day. So there, there, are, there are dangers associated with all imaging modalities and it's up to the radiologists and the clinicians and the medical physicists to practice safety in, in any modality. So here's an example of an MRI machine. Okay, moving on to my sort of discipline, uh, radiation therapy. The tenets of radiation therapy are, we want to maximize damage to cancer cells while minimizing damage or complication to normal tissue as much as possible. Radiation therapy can be broken down into two primary categories, an external beam radiation therapy and brachytherapy. And this is where the magic happens. So if you were going to go to uh, OU's medical physics program and you were working in the therapy side, this building would be where you would work, the Stevenson Cancer Center. This is home to all of their, their treatment machines and all of their um, radioactive seeds they use for brachytherapy, all of their equipment for, for uh, oncology are housed in, in, this, um, in this building. So brachytherapy, that's kind of a strange word. Uh, essentially, the idea is we use radioactive isotopes, radionuclides, and we place them in the patient, either interstitially in the tumor, intracavitary, intracavitarily, if that's a word, or on the surface. And typically they're used to treat cancers in uh, the cervix, in the prostate, the head and neck areas, and in the eye. Um, the example I wanted to look at today was eye plaque brachytherapy. So an eye plaque, essentially, a, it's, it's a very common method to treat choroidal melanomas, which are malignancies in the choroidal layer of the eye. What happens is they take a disc-shaped plaque, which is typically made of gold, 
and they implant radioactive seeds. In the case of OU's medical center, they use iridium-125. The plaque is then sutured into the eye um, in, a, in a position so that the shadow of the tumor, whenever they place these plaques, they shine very, very bright lights in the ocular cavity itself. And they look at where the shadow of the tumor is on the surface of the eye. And that, that sort of determines the location of where they, they suture the eye plaque. The radiation emitted by those radioisotopes is shaped by the gold plaque, and that's what's used to treat the malignancy. So this is sort of a cartoon of what an eye plaque would look like. So we see the gold sheet. These, these circles are where the, the oncologist or the surgeon would suture the, um, the plaque into the eye, and then these radioactive seeds are on sort of the inside, and these are what produce the energy that's used to dose the patient. Okay, so moving on to uh, external beam radiation therapy. This is, as far as OU's medical physics program goes, this is where most of the clinical responsibilities of graduate students lie in external beam radiation therapy. And it involves these treatment machines called linear accelerators, which are a form of particle accelerator. So how does a LINAC work? Or what, what's the method? How, how do these things function? Essentially, electrons up on the order of 50 keV are produced by an electron gun and injected into an accelerator tube, into an apparatus. And high-frequency microwaves, typically in the range of 3,000 megahertz, are used to accelerate those electrons in the context of radiation therapy to very high energies. The resultant electron beam can be used to treat tumors close to the surface. Electrons behave very strangely. They scatter a lot. And they're most effective at treating um, malignancies or diseases close to the surface of the skin due to their, their behavior. For malignancies or diseases deeper into the patient, what they'll do is they'll take an X-ray target, which typically is made of a very high electron density material like tungsten. And they'll use that electron beam to strike the target and produce things called brimstrong X-rays or breaking, another, another term is breaking radiation. I won't go into too much detail uh, on how these things are formed. It's essentially uh, incident electrons interact close to atomic nuclei and they're decelerated, their directions are changed via the interactions and a deceleration results in a production of an X-ray spectrum. And those X-ray photons are what, what constitute the X-ray beam in this, in this case. So here's a block diagram of of how the acceleration is accomplished, a power supply into a modulator which supplies magnetrons or klystrons, which generate the high power microwaves responsible for accelerating the particles. The electron gun supplies the electrons to this accelerator tube, which is in a vacuum. And the electrons are accelerated into the, beat, the, the treatment head, either straight on, or for example, if, if your, uh, your treatment beam has a high energy, you need longer accelerated tubes to accomplish that. In that case, the accelerated tube has to be positioned either at an angle or horizontally relative to the treatment head. And when that's done, they have to use things like bending magnets or uh, focusing coils to bend the electron beam into the treatment head. And we'll look at the treatment head geometry and the structures on the next slide. So how do X-ray beams and electron, how are X-ray beams and electron beams produced in, uh, in each, or, or in, in, a lin in a LINAC head? So figure A is an X-ray beam production figure. So the electron beam is incident on the X-ray target, which produces that uh, X-ray spectrum in the form of Bremsstrahlung X-rays. Then that primary beam is collimated and directed into a, a flattening filter, which is used to make the primary beam homogeneous and flat. Then it goes through an ion chamber, which is essentially used to monitor things like um, dose rates and field flatness to ensure that the beam delivered is, is the appropriate beam. Then it goes through secondary collimation into a slot that um, in the old days they would use for wedges, physical wedges, blocks, and compensators to further shape the beam. They don't really do that anymore. They use other, other methods, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And that x-ray beam, that primary x-ray beam is, is what's incident on the patient, is what will um, penetrate and treat deep-seated tumors in the patient. 
In figure B, we have an example where the electron beam is the clinical beam. So the X-ray target is moved out. And there, there's a, a structure in Linac heads called a carousel, which rotates between either a flattening filter uh, for the purpose of X-ray production or a scattering foil for the purpose of electron beam production. The scattering foil uh, scatters the initial electron beam and constitutes the clinical beam that would be used to treat the patient. Okay, so we've talked about how the acceleration is, is accomplished. We've talked about the geometry of the LINAC head, which is this structure here. What about the gantry? The gantry is this entire structure. So gantries, modern gantries at least, are designed such that this, this X-ray source or this radiation source can rotate about the patient. So if you imagine a horizontal rotational axis coming out of the wall, this gantry and this specific model is a true beam. So this, this, uh, this gantry can accomplish full 360 degree rotation about, um, about the patient body. Not all models are capable of doing that. Uh, it just depends on, on the model and the purpose of the machine. But this specific one is capable of rotating totally around the patient. The point of intersection of the collimator axis or the beam axis and the gantry rotational axis is called machine isocenter. And that's a very important concept when you're talking about taking measurements in the commissioning and um, acceptance of machines because isocenter is sort of the reference point where all those measurements are taken. Okay, so we've talked about photon beam, how those are produced, electron beams. Um, another modality we're gonna talk about in a few minutes is proton beam therapy, but first, uh, we're going to further categorize photon therapy into two modern modalities, an IMRT and VMAT. IMRT is an acronym for Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy. It's a technique that utilizes non-uniform beams, beams with different intensities, to deliver high doses to the tumor volume while sparing uh, healthy tissue as much as possible. Uh, in order to accomplish this, you have to have a treatment planning system in a LINAC system that are capable of delivering those modulated beams. Uh, in addition to the X-ray jaws or the, the primary and secondary collimators we saw earlier, IMRT capable LINACs also have to be equipped with multi-leaf collimators, which the reason why things like physical wedges or compensators are obsolete is because we have the capability of using these MLCs. And you'll see a picture of that on the next slide. MLCs, these are, these are uh, lead leaf leaves that, that are capable of producing arbitrary shapes, meaning you can fit your radiation beam to essentially any shape that the tumor might take. So if you imagine before the advent of IMRT and before, um, before MLCs were available, say your tumor was approximately this shape, you would only be able to create like a rectangular field. And in that situation, so if you look at like this section here, you would have to fit your rectangular field, uh, trying to minimize damage to surrounding tissue as much as possible, but you're going to interact with a lot of healthy tissue if you're not capable of really fitting your beam to the, to the structure of the tumor. And the MLCs will fit to the uh, size and the shape of the tumor depending on the beam angle because tumors are very asymmetric structures. They're, they're not pretty geometrically different uh, perspectives will have very different geometries, very different tumor geometries associated with them. So they have to have the capability of, of changing collimation depending on the angle at which the beam is delivered. So what are some drawbacks to IMRT? Um, it's certainly better than, than the old days in which they wouldn't really modulate the intensity of the beam. They, they wouldn't use a lot of varying angles, but it still has some, some issues. An example of that would be the gantry and the MLCs can't move while the beam is being delivered. And the dose rate or the rate at which the, the beam is, is being applied or the, the rate at which the monitor units, which is the beam, the, the Linux ability to um, produce the energy are being generated is not changing. So you have a constant dose rate and your gantry and your MLCs can't move during the beam delivery. 
the modality that came as uh, a solution to that is VMAT or volumetric modulated arc therapy. Uh, in this situation, the gantry is able to continuously move all the way around the patient and the MLCs and dose rates are dynamic. They can move and change as the gantry rotates around the patient as the beam is being delivered. Uh, the primary benefit of using VMAT over IMRT is reduction in treatment time. So uh, patients, even though they might not appear to be moving during delivery, your body still has a lot of involuntary motion associated with things like breathing. And tumors that are very small, for example, um, slight motion can move the tumor significantly uh, relative to the size of the field that you're using. So it's very important to reduce the amount of patient motion as much as possible when delivering uh, radiation therapy. So here's some treatment comparisons between older modalities, 2D uh, radiation therapy in which the intensity wasn't modulated at all. Uh, they use parallel opposing beams and you see you have relatively high doses in the integral region between the surface of the patient and the malignancy. This, in this case, these were all uh, prostate cases. So there are a lot of critical structures in this region that are being dosed at relatively high levels because they aren't modulating the intensity of the beams. The second modality, uh, still an old one, 3D conformal radiation therapy. They started um, modulating intensity a little bit, but the, the parallel opposing beams are still approximately the same intensity. And these oblique beams are also still the same intensity. They, they, they don't modulate much as far as intensity goes and they use very fixed angles. So you still have high dose regions between um, the surface of the patient and the malignancy. With the advent of IMRT, they were able to reduce dose to the surface of the patient and the interstitial region between the surface and the, and the malignancy by a lot. You can see, instead of having like a green color, a relatively high dose, you've got uh, kind of a softer or a blue color now or a softer green color in those regions. And with rapid arc, which is a fancy word for VMAT, that advantage is seen even higher. So uh, as the gantry is continuously rotating around the patient, you're able to create very conformal, very homogeneous dose distributions on the malignancy while also reducing dose in these uh, integral regions between the service and the malignancy. Okay, so moving on to proton therapy. We've talked about Photon therapy, we didn't touch a lot on electron therapy, but that isn't, there isn't much uh, that you would experience as a grad student uh, as far as dealing with electron therapy treatments. Uh, proton therapy, though, is a very booming modality in radiation therapy, and that's primarily due to uh, the uh, ability of proton therapy to uh, reduce dose to healthy structures, and we'll see sort of the physics behind that here in a few minutes, but Protons are relatively very heavy particles, and that means that they have high stopping power and high linear energy transfer. And those two qualities are very closely related to how the dose is deposited in the medium, in this case, in the patient. So as the particle slows in the medium, the rate of energy loss via ionization and excitation in the surrounding medium increases to a maximum. And that rate is proportional to the charge squared, Q squared, over or inversely proportional to um, the velocity of the particle squared. Particles that have higher stopping power will slow down faster in the medium and resulting in, in higher uh, production of ionization and excitation in the medium. So because of those phenomena, you get something called a Bragg peak associated with, with proton therapy. And we'll see in a second the, the, the relative dose versus depth curve for photon therapy. And you'll kind of see why proton therapy is advantageous in sparing normal tissue. So the depth on the x-axis is kind of cut off is on the scale of millimeters. And the y-axis is relative dose. So say your target is approximately I don't know, 320, 330 millimeters deep into the patient. The region proximal to that is receiving relatively low dose. And the region distal to that is receiving virtually zero dose or very, very little dose. So proton therapy is very effective in sparing proximal tissues between the surface of the patient, which would be say depth zero and distal regions 
beyond the target volume. You're sparing a lot of healthy tissue and that's advantageous in situations like head and neck treatments or brain treatments, as well as pediatric cases where uh, your priority is to save as much healthy tissue as possible because complications that arise, even though you know it might be, might be years down the road for a pediatric case for a child, 30 years isn't nothing. Whereas 30 years is a lot for somebody that's, or uh, 30 years isn't, isn't that much for somebody that's like 60, for example. So proton therapy is very effective in sparing healthy tissue. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it's becoming a very popular modality now. But we noticed in, in the previous picture, this is a very narrow region. Uh, it's constituted by one proton beam. Clinically, they wouldn't use one proton beam. They would use multiple proton beams to constitute what's called a spread out Bragg peak or an SOBP. This uh, use of, of range modulation and multiple proton beams constitutes a wider or a larger area, um, a larger effective area, a larger range of those, of those protons. So you've got a, a larger effective area to treat. But we still see very, very beneficial a dose drop off in the distal region and the proximal dose is still relatively low. So if you compare how the dose is deposited in a proton uh, curve relative to a photon curve, you can see the distal region for say a 6MB photon beam is very spread out. And you see the, the 6MB uh, photon beam is the, the line with triangles. The distance that dose is still deposited goes much further in the patient than it does for proton beams, for example. So the primary reason why you would want to use a proton beam as opposed to a photon beam is to spare healthy tissue. Okay, so move on to clinical work. So we've talked about uh, nuclear medicine lightly. We talked about diagnostic imaging and we've talked about radiation therapy to some extent. Now I wanted to talk about what your responsibilities would be as a graduate student working in uh, a therapy department of like cancer center, for example, the Stevenson Cancer Center. So your two primary uh, tasks that you accomplish uh, independently, there are some others that we'll talk about later that you'll do um, along with physicists are patient specific quality assurance testing and monthly mechanical quality assurance testing on linear accelerators. So what do we, what do we mean by patient specific quality assurance testing? What happens is uh, dosimetrists or people responsible for creating treatment plans will take a case, say somebody has a, a, a malignancy or a tumor in their pelvis, and they'll generate a treatment plan. So our goal is to come in and create what's called a verification plan or a QA plan um, and, and calculate the dose distribution in that QA plan. We'll then take that that plan and deliver it to a detector on the actual physical LINAC. And these treatment planning systems that they use to calculate are capable of, of calculating um, the dose distributions. So what we'll do is we'll take the measured values of the detector, the measured dose distribution of the detector, and compare it to the calculated values to ensure that uh, what's being delivered is within tolerance of uh, what's being calculated. And after that, you do record keeping. Um, as far as uh, how you perform your analysis, um, what are your results? You'll, you'll keep all that in Excel in an Excel spreadsheet. So this is an example of a detector you would use. This is called a map check. It's uh, developed by a company called Sun Nuclear, and it's used specifically for uh, photon external photon beam therapy machines. So you do IMRT QA, which is the photon specific photon patient specific QA. You do IMRT QA and VMAT QA. Um, OUHSC or more specifically the, Steven the Stevenson Cancer Center has a proton therapy machine as well. So graduate students are able to do quality assurance testing on treatment plans created for proton therapy machines, which is a very, very unique opportunity. There are only, I wanna say there are, there are maybe 30 proton centers in the country. In fact, OU's was only the second um, in the country that was that was capable of treating patients, as opposed to the thousands of, of photon therapy machines that are available. So um, this is a very unique opportunity, and it's something very, very marketable as well, because uh, proton therapy is becoming a very um, 
popular field in, in uh, medical physics. So the second half of your duties that you do independently are monthly mechanical quality assurance checks. So essentially what you do, that, that big machine we saw earlier that, that was the, the gantry with the associated LINAC head, um, what we have to do is test to make sure that the mechanical aspects of that LINAC are functioning appropriately. So we'll make sure that the gantry can rotate and the displayed, the, the, what, what it's saying it's rotating to is actually physically what it's rotating to. We'll do that with gantry motion, with collimation, with table motion. We do that with um, our distance indicators. So if the table is 100 centimeters from the LINAC head, we wanna make sure that it's actually 100 centimeters from the LINAC head. So we do a lot of measurements like that. We test field flatness and symmetry. So we'll, we'll see how flat the radiation beam is, how symmetric it is. And we'll also test radiation field measurements versus light field measurements. Um, so the, the way you determine the size of your radiation field is via a light field. And the machine that I currently work on uses film as a way to test this. Um, what we do, you, you'll shine a light field that's associated with, with some collimation. So you shine light through your collimator and that makes a field. You'll take a marker and mark on the film uh, where your light field is, and then you'll shoot the beam associated with that collimation. And we have different methods to um, measure the accuracy or measure the distance, the difference between the radiation field and the light field to make sure that our collimators are working properly. Um, so the fields that we're, we're delivering are actually of the right dimensions. Other tasks associated with medical physics graduate students would be monthly output, which is you're, you're, you're testing the accuracy and the measurement of the beams, the, the clinically approved beams associated with each linear accelerator, as well as annual quality assurance testing, in which you, you essentially do a full rundown of the machine and all its functioning and compare it to the baseline measurements that were taken when the machine was um, commissioned and accepted. Okay. So I know I don't have a lot of time left, but we'll kind of go through research really quick. My primary uh, research topic is uh, to perform dosimetric and radiobiological comparisons of different treatment modalities given different treatment sites. Uh, the two sites that we're looking at currently are lung sites and brain sites. And the modalities we're using are rapid arc or VMAT photon therapy and pencil beam scanning and double scattering proton therapy modalities. So our goal, oh, yeah, let me talk about this first. So in order to, to quantify the different parameters we're going to use to, to, to do those comparisons, we have to be able to visualize and measure things like uh, dose associated with different volumes. So this is an example of a dose volume histogram in which you see the, you have an index here, you have a planning target volume, a clinical target volume, as well as some normal structures, some normal tissues like the heart, the spinal canal, the esophagus, the lungs. And the way you read this, these are all relative volumes to the total, to the total volume of the structure. So say, if I wanted to know how much dose uh, a fifth of the volume of the heart is receiving, I would go from 0.2 out and then draw a line straight down. And this is the dose in gray that that volume, that fraction of the volume of the heart is receiving. So you can see uh, we're, we're trying to maximize dose um, to the largest volume of the tumor as possible while minimizing dose to the smallest uh, volume of normal structures as possible. So we can use these dose volume histograms to find things like conformity indices and homogeneity indices. A conformity index is essentially, you're measuring how conformal your beam is relative to the target volume. So you're taking the volume that's treated and dividing it by the volume that was clinically defined. And that gives you some idea of how conformal your beam is. Um, a way to measure how homogeneous your beam is, is through this homogeneity index in which you take the minimum dose to 2% of the target volume minus the minimum dose to 98% of the target volume and divide it by the prescription dose. This gives you a way to determine how homogeneous, how even or normal your, your, your dose distribution is. 
So that's how you would, that, those are some examples of how you would perform dosimetric comparisons or dosimetric calculations. Radiobiological comparisons come in the form of tumor control probability curves and normal tissue probability, uh, normal tissue complication probability curves. So in therapy, our goal is to maximize damage to tumor cells and minimize damage to normal tissues. So if, you, if you're able to create these TCPs and NTCPs, you're able to visualize the effect of a modality or the effect of a specific treatment given a site. You're, you're able to visualize how effective it is at accomplishing that goal at, at um, damaging tumor cells and damaging, and, and, uh, damaging normal tissue. So these, these two probability curves give you that ability to, to visualize the essential, essentially the radiobiological effectiveness of a tumor modality. So in summary, my research project is to perform dosimetric comparisons between those different modalities at different sites by calculating things like uh, the conformity index, the homogeneity index, and equivalent uniform dose, as well as performing radiobiological comparisons by calculating and creating these tissue complication or tissue control probability curves and normal tissue complication probability curves associated with those treatment plans and those different uh, treatment sites. Uh, the resources I use, just books. Uh, you get access to a lot of good books in medical physics, so it wasn't that hard to find a lot of resources. And that's about it. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions and field any questions or concerns anybody has. Okay, anybody want ask any questions? Maybe let me get started. Uh, I have two questions for you. Okay. Uh, first, uh, what do you think, uh, how is your uh, education at NSU uh, prepare you for your degree? Like maybe tell us the process. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's been great. I mean, one thing that people at NSC don't really understand is how lucky they are to have PhDs teaching every class that they have. Because that's not the case in a lot of other universities. You don't have the level of, of experience that, that you would have at NSU in explaining all those concepts to you. So it's it prepared me beyond what I expected it to, to be totally honest. Um, there are people, you're coming from these programs, <laughs> Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> Coming from these programs, I mean, you're able to compete with people that are, you know, there's a guy, there, there's a girl that has a biomedical engineering degree from UT Austin that, that's in our program. And, and you're, you're in the same boat as she is. You're doing the same thing she is. You're, you're as competitive as she is. Wow. Uh, there are people with EE degrees from Michigan Tech. There are people, you know, with all sorts of degrees and you're able to compete with them and, and do well in these programs in the same way that they are. So yeah, NSU is a, is specifically their STEM program, STEM degrees. They're very, very, very good. And that's kind of the point why I wanted to talk to you guys. Uh, STEM majors are in a really unique position in that you've got a lot of opportunities now to pursue higher education and to really, really become hyper successful. And you, you have all the tools that you need uh, coming from NSU. So yeah, it, it's been great. Yeah. Short answer is it's really good. Cool. I mean, I saw a question from a message, like a Trey asked question. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you, can you see that question? Uh, maybe. Yeah, from message. Do, do, do they uh, touch much on things such as uh, endoscopic uh, son sonography or sonography in general? Sonography. So you're talking about like, uh, like ultrasound applications? Oh, hold on. Chat. Oh, there's a lot of chats. No, from, from Trey. Yeah, you see from Okay, uh, discopic sonography in general. Uh, no, yeah. So um, MRI is an example of non-radiation based imaging that they'll, they'll teach you about. Ultrasound is another one. Yeah, there, there are a lot of imaging modalities that you'll talk about that aren't radiation based. Uh, you won't see that in treatment because the, the idea of treatment is to cause damage, right? So you won't see non-radiation based treatments, but you'll see because you don't really touch on chemo. In medical physics that's not in, in your wheelhouse um it's more it's uh, on the imaging side you will see several modalities that don't use radiation for imaging so yeah i have another question uh sounds like you you learn a lot just in one year you know from your <laughs> yeah talk. but can yeah. you tell us like what, what's your uh, most favorite thing in this program and what's your uh most 
and uh, dislike the most thing uh, that you dislike about this program you're in right now? Um. Well, so my favorite thing is sort of the reason why I liked NSU so much. It's because our program is small. Uh -huh. We have like nine people. So you're sort of forced to communicate with each other and you really have to communicate and, and work as a team to do a lot of things. And you're only as good. This is super true. And everybody's told me this and it's very true. You're only as good as the weakest person in your program. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring everybody up to the same level. That's, that's sort of the, the goal, right? Um, and that, that happens here. You know, there is nobody that, that's falling behind because everybody is working to bring everybody up to the same level. And the faculty are great. The clinical experience is ridiculous. I mean, the, there's, it's so hands-off. You just walk into the clinic and you start working and that's it. And you know, you're not supervised. They trust you. You can make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. It's not uncommon, but you, it's, it's a program that's meant for people to learn. And, and I think that's, that's not, it's not as common as it should be where the goal is to m make somebody capable of doing a job really well. And then putting them out in the world, and that's that's what this program does. Okay. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, appreciation from the chats, as you can see here. Uh, but <laughs> let, let's, give our, yeah, let's give our speaker a round of applause, virtual applause, or, <laughs> or whatever you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really appreciate it for this. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I also wanted to, in case anybody has any questions, because. Anybody here is capable of doing something like this. If anybody has any questions on on how you would go about getting to a graduate program, you can email me. You can you can ask me questions. I can send Dr. Zhang my OU email, and you can send me questions whenever you like. And and I'll also email him this this PowerPoint so he can give you guys the 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 links that you would need to. Yeah, that'd be to, great. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, you're one of our. Uh, I mean, first generation fitness majors. You yeah. Know? It's really yeah. good to see you do uh, successful in that program, and you kind of opened like a door for us, you know, like a well, I mean, can follow, you know. I owe it to NSU. In all honesty, I mean, I wouldn't be here if, if honestly, I, I don't think I would have been here if it wasn't for NSU, which is kind of interesting to think about. You know, it's mm -hmm. maybe if I'd gone to OU, maybe I wouldn't have done this. You know, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to think about. But yeah, it's uh you stem guys anybody in physics chemistry math computer science you guys have a lot of opportunities to do a lot of great things and it just you're only limited by by your work ethic essentially so just get out there and do it yeah okay do we do we have other questions okay if you, not then uh let, let's thank our speaker and uh i mean that's that's it for today thank you for everybody show up today yeah thank you guys for showing up and thanks for having me over <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matthew, for giving yeah. us the talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, see you next time. Yeah, I, I'll have I'll have Matthew's uh, information and his talk if any anybody interested. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'll probably, if you like, I could I could do this again. You know, maybe next semester or something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. <laughs> All right. See you guys later. See you.